uh, I've got uh, I've got uh, somebody pointed out something that I skipped and I'm going to go back and pick it up so we're ready to start you can turn turn this on where we start on. get us in the right spot there turn okay on. we're going to talk about the little scroll well give, give us the verse and everything then oh let's see before chapter 11 I think chapter 11 just before it's chapter 10 verse 9 see I was already through with 11 and I, the, I'll tell you, I have a confession to make. The reason I skipped it was I couldn't fit it into the context. Uh, I didn't uh, really agree with all that Hendrickson had to say about it, but uh, some of it. And then uh, my friend and I, otherwise known as the cameraman, uh, <laughs> Uh, we're talking about it before class like we do a lot about a lot of things it's, it's a kind of graduate level education to listen to us talk uh, I'm not sure what you'd graduate from but, <laughs> but uh, it suddenly clicked in place now this is not the only place in the Bible where you have a little scroll handed to a prophet. Uh, it's done to Jeremiah, it's done in Ezekiel, and the idea is of this little scroll that you eat it and it tastes good, but then it turns bitter, or some versions say sour, uh, in your stomach. And I didn't really understand how that fit in, but it fits perfectly. This is a standard prophetic picture of, and remember that the prophets spoke at great length about the day of the Lord. Now, there's like a lot of things in the in the Bible there are days of the Lord and then there is the day of the Lord and you have to watch that distinction a day of the Lord is when God intervenes in the flow of history to change history that's that's my own definition but that I think that will hold true in every place you find it and creation then is, what creation is the day. creation is a day of the Lord uh, the flood was a day of the Lord now included in the concept of the day of the Lord is always the concept of God's judging it is God intervenes to set right something that's wrong. Now, that's what the idea of this little scroll is. It is a prediction of a day of the Lord. Now, the reason that it starts out sweet and turns bitter is that the day of the Lord is sweet to the people, God's people, God's faithful people, but always bitter to God's enemies. And you see how that fits right in here? This is between the sounding of the sixth trumpet and the seventh. There's the interlude. God's people are sealed or made, signed or made in this case measured when the sanctuary is measured they are protected and that really is something that we believers need to think about when we talk about the day of judgment 
it scares the heck out of some believers to realize that all people will be judged. Uh, there's people have a hard time with Paul in the book of Romans where he makes it, you know, we're saved by grace, we're justified, made right by, by God and so on like that. But then he says that all people, both Jew and Gentile, believer and unbeliever, will face judgment. And if you came out of a tradition like I came out of, where you were always half in and half out of salvation, uh, that was not a very comfortable position to be in. And I didn't know what to do with it until I got somewhat spiritually grown. So that's what's going on here. John is in the line of the prophets of God. He is telling about the coming of the day of the Lord. And he wants to, God wants to remind us through John that he's talking about the final judgment, which will be sweet for some and bitter for others. The thing is, those who have been saved by faith, by grace through faith, have had the decision already rendered in their favor. That's what justify means. It's a legal, a juridical term. And it means we're declared innocent. And so we don't have to worry about being judged. We have been declared innocent, not on the basis of who we are or what we, anything we've done, but on the basis of our trust in the work of Christ. We are included in God's covenant people. And we're going to get some more about that when we get to the next big section. So the eating of this little scroll is to remind and would have reminded the original readers of the book of Revelation that of that fact, that the idea of the judgment time is both sweet and bitter according to your relationship to God. And I don't know why that had taken me so long to, to put those together, but my friend here, uh, I, I don't even know what, can't even remember what you said, but it just sud it suddenly just flashed full grown. You think of Sodom and Gomorrah, and everything that led up to that and the aftermath, it was a, a sweet to Abraham that God wouldn't destroy the, the city, and yet he had to, but he did save Lot and his two daughters, although his wife, you know, was turned to blood of salt. So you have that mixture yeah. of, of salvation and yet judgment. Yeah, that, that's the idea, that, that when God intervenes, it is always in behalf of his people. You know, we, and I can't overemphasize this because one of the common things I see among believers today is how helpless they feel. We live in a time of rapid social change. We live in a time when uh, the old moral uh, foundations that we thought were unchangeable. We oughtn't to have fooled ourselves that way because uh, human morality has always changed and usually for the worse. Uh, but we, you find that. And that's one of the things that, that is uh, feeding into our paranoia about government. Uh, because things, the government's not far things that we always thought they would be far. And so we feel helpless. But we're not helpless, folks. God is on our side. Now, that doesn't mean that God is going to 
single us out, you know, and surround us with cotton candy and keep the bad things from happening. But it's different with us. He will always, I'm going to take a passage from uh, Paul, but a little out of context, but I think it fits. When he says they, they will all, with every temptation will come a way of escape. And with every bad thing that happens, God will take care of his people. Now that doesn't mean that if I stand on the breakwater uh, of Lake Pontchartrain, when a class five hurricane is coming in, that God will protect me from drowning in the, in the floodwaters. But I have a different place to go. I have a different relationship with God. I keep coming back to the phrase where it says, precious in the sight of God are the death of his saints. Our death is different. We die, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment, the writer of Hebrews says. But I don't have to fear the judgment. I've already got my verdict in my pocket, as it were. I can show the judge. Not that I think the judgment will be like you find cartoons and all in the newspaper, where you go up and you plead your case. Pat. Max had an illustration from the days of soccer when his uh, girls played soccer. After a game, one of the parents owned a restaurant, a, a cafeteria, mm -hmm. and they all went through the line and she had promised everyone that's, that's part of our soccer team, uh, I'll pay your bill. Mm -hmm. But they got there at different times, the line was mixed, and so she stood by the line, and as the bill came up, she would say, this one is mine. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly what Jesus promises to do, you know. He says, everyone who owns me I'm paraphrasing a little bit everyone who owns me I will own before my father and his angels I'm collating two different versions in <laughs> two different gospels if you don't know uh, but they, they're both there and if anyone disowns me I will disown them and I see that fits Max. I, Max is one of the world's great in finding a story to illustrate points. The world is there. Yes. The list of, of, of what you owe is there. Yes. Yes. That's right. Uh, there's a famous story about the man who first got all of the uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, papyrus documents that were, let's see, what, I can't remember the name where it is. It's in the uh, Delta region of Egypt. And they found a whole bunch of mummified animals because not only did the Egyptians mummify people, they mummified animals too. And they stuffed these animals with a lot of what we'd call waste paper. And they, they have taught us more about the common life of people in the first century BC to the first century AD than any other single source. And a lot of them are bills where you have a list, you know, there's your, the name, the name of the company, there's a list of what you owe. And then on it they would have the Greek letters, a, uh, alpha phi, with a bar over it, and that means uh, uh, an abbreviation. And for years people, what does that mean? Somebody realized that's the abbreviation for aphiasin, which means it's the word that's translated forgiveness in the New Testament. 
So here's a bill. You owe it, but it's been marked alpha fee. And that's what it means. We owe God for our sins. We, we're indebted, but he paid the debt. What's the old hymn? We paid the debt and made us free or set us free, isn't it? And that's, that's what we're talking about here. So you'll remember the scroll that turned bitter. And it's an assurance that judgment will pass us by. The okay. Hymn is, I will sing of my Redeemer. Uh, yes, I'll try. Well, there was one, another one that said, I had a debt I could not pay. He, I was trying to think of what the next he word, paid he paid the day, <laughs> debt, he right. He paid he the debt. Not, but he did not owe. Right, he had a debt he did not owe. He paid the debt. Well, you can save yourself. Huh? Maybe to save myself. Right, I was trying to think of the words, but yeah, yeah. he paid a debt. Okay. One of the things, I think when you were talking about the scroll and the bitterness, um, another writer, I think it's Bruce, parallels that with Ezekiel when mm -hmm. he talks about the sweetness. Yes. But he also talks about how in bitterness he had to go to tell the people what God had said. So there's a lot of parallels with Ezekiel's passage. And yes, see, yes, see, the prophets were, had, that's the reason I said the idea of the sweetness and the bitterness is really a summation of the role of prophets. They had the job of telling Israel that uh, of God who is good, but you have violated his covenant, and so there's bitterness to come to you. That's, any, anybody else have any comments, questions? We, I was gonna make a comment earlier, but I forgot, no. We can be really encouraged by two things that have happened here in Revelation. And one is that our prayers will have an effect on history. That's a promise of God mm -hmm. to us. And the other one is that we are not going to be there alone. We're going to have the man with the keys going to be right with us. Okay, you know, that's right. Pay the debts. Yes. Anybody else? I was just thinking of Habakkuk. And you know, he starts out complaining about uh, the the justice not being served and then God reveals to him you know judgment and when he sees judgment he's a, you know he's appalled by what God's judgment is going to be you know it talks about the Babylonians coming and and they're worse than than the injustice that's going on but at the end you know he comes to realize God's judgment is, is beneficial so that's almost a little bit backwards yeah but the the one verse that sticks out in in there when uh, he's talking about judgment is the, the one that Paul quotes where it says the righteous will live by faith yes and that's stuck kind of in the middle of all that that, that is exactly the context and by the way modern Pauline scholarship emphasizes that when Paul quoted a short passage he included the context that was, was in the original. And that if we really want to know what Paul meant, we have to go back to the Old Testament and read the context. And there, see, all of these things fit together. There's one thing that I have found uh, in my recent study, and that includes translating the New Testament but in listening to some of the more modern biblical scholars, is how tightly the plan of God fits together. Uh, it looks like a mosaic when you, you know, just bits and pieces. Have you, have you ever looked real closely at a mosaic and there's just bits and pieces? Or maybe the pointillist uh, painter, Surratt, if you get up close and it's just a bunch of colored dots, but you step back about six or eight feet and it's suddenly a complete picture of things. And that's, that's what I'm learning about the plan of God, that it's, that it's tightly woven together in a single tapestry. 
of salvation. We're going to get a little more of that. Okay. We've already gone through the 11th uh, chapter of the book. So I'm going to assume that we're through there. The one thing that I really in, in liked there was where it says uh, about the... Uh, Oh, where they will, God will destroy those who destroy the earth. That was one of the last things I mentioned last time. And that, if you want a biblical justification for taking care of the environment, that's a pretty good one right there. Uh, because uh, people, have, human beings have always treated the earth miserably. Our problem is that there never was enough people before to, that the earth couldn't recover. There's so many of us now that we can do damage so quickly and completely that the earth doesn't have time to recover. And God's going to hold some of us responsible for that. Okay, we now make a major change. When in our study of Revelation. The first 11 chapters viewed the battle between e the church and evil as if it were from the earth looking upward. With <coughs> the beginning of the 12th chapter, we go behind the scenes. If, if it's true that John was inspired, at least in part, by the seven arched uh, dramatic scenery of the theater at Ephesus, which I think is probably true. Then we have ceased to be an audience looking at the actors. We've gone behind the scenes and have seen what motivates and what uh, is going on behind the scenes. And that will may, may not become completely apparent until we've gone a little deeper into it. But you will see that there, there is a sea change between the way the first 11 chapters are viewed and the second 11. A great and wondrous sign appeared in the heaven a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. In the version of teaching this that I had one, at one time, the one I told you about where an artist did some pen, and, I mean some uh, colored pencil sketches for me of the scenes. This r woman was she was as tall. The idea of she had the sun as her head and the moon under her feet, it's size that's meant here. Uh, can you think of a woman who is so tall that the sun is behind her head and under her feet is the moon? It, it's, it's an idea of a gigantic woman, but it's not a fearful woman, not, not one that causes fear. Maybe awe at her majesty, her greatness, her size, and she is struggling to give birth. And then suddenly, there's a great red dragon. And you can just see, have you ever uh, seen uh, a cat stalking something. Have you ever seen the way their tail does? That's what 
the picture that John is trying to get here. Don't take it too literally that they knocking the stars out of the sky, but the, the, the dragon is as huge in its way as the woman is in hers. And he has that, he's stalking her. Actually not stalking her, but the child she is going to bring forth. Now, I'm not going to do what Hendrickson does, but I'm going to tell you about it. This woman, people will say, I remember as a child hearing that, this woman is the church, and so does Hendrickson say that. I believe that's his Calvinist background speaking, because they talk about the church in the Old Testament. The church did not exist in the Old Testament because the church is the body of Christ. But something did exist in the Old Testament that still exists in the New. And that is the concept of the people of God. And I don't mind telling you, I got that idea from F.F. F. Bruce, who is a pretty fair New Testament scholar. I'll take him any day. Any day. He, he is very uh, believing. He's very open and honest. And he knows the New Testament really well. And that concept is the people of God. God has always had a people. It started out by every human being being the people of God. But they wouldn't do his will, so he separated out. He saved Noah and his family. That still didn't undo the damage done to humanity by Adam. So he goes to Ur in Chaldea and calls out Abraham and says, I will make you a great people of mine and all the nations of the world will be blessed because of your descendant. But that doesn't work as well as he wanted to either. But the people of God, now the people of God did produce the Christ. I keep emphasizing to my Sunday morning class that Jesus was a Jew and that the proper background for understanding the New Testament is first century Judaism and the things it was interested in. And so the people of God. Now, what I started to tell you about Hendrickson he goes back and traces how Satan tried to oppose the line that ended up producing the Messiah. And he does a really good job. My favorite one is Josiah. Adaliah, who was uh, associated with uh, Ahab and Jezebel set her mind that she was going to kill all the people in the lineage of David. And she wiped out most of them. But there was a brave nursemaid that took the six-month-old Josiah and hid in the basement. Now, the basement of what? probably the palace, but I, you can't tell from reading the story. But she hid him and hid him until he was old enough to come out of, on his own. That's how close Satan came to interfering with the plan of God. There's another time or two that he lists uh, 
I think some of them are a little far-fetched, but they're defensible, every one of them. So remember that this picture of Satan trying to stop the birth of the Christ according to God's plan is, is accurate. Is an old King Herod even considered part of that? Well, yes, that's one he made. Yes. Herod tried to, to do the same thing. And notice how much blood and slaughter. If you really want to know how evil Satan can be, chalk up all the deaths of these children to him. His, he, would, he doesn't scruple about killing one person or a thousand. He doesn't scruple about killing men or women or children or babies. And that's exactly, I want you to notice a parallel here. There's a parallel there between what Satan did to keep Christ from being born according to the plan of God and what Rome was doing to the body of Christ, the church. There, that be the sweeping of the stars? That, that, is it illustrated there perhaps? It could be, but I, I think that's getting too deep. Okay. The thing about it is that Satan was going to, if at all possible, he didn't want Christ to be born. Now, one of the strange things about Satan is, and I've heard people speculate on this, if he was some kind of supernatural being, why didn't he know that he couldn't beat God? Couldn't help himself. Too much pride. <laughs> well, it's easy to say too much pride. There may be a a hint that will help us understand that. Do you know that very few criminals ever consider that they might be caught and punished? That, that's one of the things that you can find from talking with policemen. It's amazing. Uh, they never take into consideration the fact that they might get caught they always assume they're going to be successful. In one sense, criminals are the most optimistic people in the world. And they're often disabused of that optimism. So if they are following their father, Satan, maybe he is one of those. Now, I know that there's a hint of that in John Milton's Paradise Lost. The emphasis in Paradise Lost is pride, as Jesse said. But there's some of that he does not even consider he won't be successful. And that's, that's one of the things that uh, I've had uh, several very close friends who were policemen. And I've checked with them on that. And they said they never saw a criminal that wasn't surprised that they got caught. They always have this idea, if I'd just done this, I wouldn't have gotten caught. Even when they are. So there you have. He's going to keep the Christ from being born. I've lost my place in my outline too. Let's go ahead. His tail swept a third of the stars and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. That can be nobody but Christ. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Now, if we stop right here, 
This passes over the whole life of Jesus in one sentence. So you, what you need to realize that this is permissible in this symbolic treatment of history so that you don't have a, a, but the idea is that while he was on earth he did what he came to do and he was not snatched up to the throne of God until he had done everything that God sent him to do it is finished. So that means Satan could not stop that. Think about the, I always do a lot of times, the scene between Jesus and Pilate. <coughs> and Pilate says, uh, aren't you going to defend yourself? And I'm thinking about Jesus' answer to that. He effectively says, you can't kill me. Imagine, here was a man that represented the power and authority of Rome. He had about half a legion of soldiers, about 3,000 soldiers, in Jerusalem at the time. Now he didn't usually keep that many in Jerusalem. He usually had them in their barracks at Caesarea Maritima up the coast. But since it was Passover time, he brought the whole half of legion there. They could have killed anybody they wanted to. Just, they, they, had, they had enough force to do it. And yet here was Jesus, calmly. He had already been beaten by the people from the synagogue, uh, not the synagogue, the Sanhedrin soldiers. He had already been probably beaten by some Roman soldiers. And his body was all aching and racked with pain as the old song says but he stood up and said you can't kill me now how, how do you respond to that you want some feedback crazy what you're crazy <laughs> <laughs> yes that, that might be what uh, Pilate would say Anybody else? I, I like that one. It shows that he gave his life. It wasn't taken from him. Okay. We're going to, we're going to pursue that a little more. Anybody else? I would think you would say, well, you're already half dead. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Pilate knew what to say. I mean, he, here he was, a, a ruler who people basically snap to when he told them something. Sort of like a military officer. Mm -hmm. And when somebody He says, was a military officer. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, and so when he says something like that, he was just kind of like dumbfounded. Yeah. Okay. All these things, but let's put this now in the context of the book of Revelation. That context is Rome was killing believers who are the body of Christ. In fact, they're so much identified with Christ that when Jesus appeared in, to Paul on the road to Damascus, he said, why are you persecuting me? Now, what does it mean there? that he says, you can't kill me. Are you with me? I, mean, if I see some... Whenever there's persecution... Just be quiet, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, can't, you can't stop this. You can't, you can't stop, stop, stop the body this. Of Christ. Yeah, you, can't you can't stop, stop this redemption, redemption story. Yes. But 
think about what a shot in the arm, we might say, this would be to believers who were under threat. Now think about that. Here was Jesus. And he was their leader. He was more than that. He was their life. And he said, you can't kill me. Can you see where the early believers got their courage from? That's the point I want you to see. There's story after story that are in all probability true. There's the man who said, I have served the Lord for 74 years. Shall I prove false to him now? The interrogator didn't want to put this 74-year-old man to death. He was an honest man. He was a man respected by the community. You know what his name was? Right. <laughs> I a expected, disciple of John. A disciple of John, yes. That makes the connection even closer, doesn't it, Pat? Because John was writing this. It was Polycarp. And he said, I'm not going to dis disown him now. I want you to see that the idea of this being written to the persecuted church really is meaningful and through them to us. Now, I don't suspect that any of us, I may be wrong, but I don't suspect any of us in our lifetime will face what Polycarp faced. But I can certainly see a possibility of it in my great-grandchildren. I can't, that's being just very honest with the way I see the world going. I know of people, a few of which I know personally. I talked with a young man from northwestern Nigeria who was serving Nigerian food in the basement of the uh, uh, old train station in D.C. What is it called? Uh, Union, station. What? Union Station. Union Station. And his brother had been killed because he was a believer. And this young man had fled from northwestern Nigeria. Someone said there have been more Christians that have been martyred in the past 50 years than in the rest of the history of Christianity. Yes, that's for sure, Pat. There's about a, something like a thousand people a day converting to Christ in sub-Saharan Africa. There's something like 50 to 100 believers a day suffering persecution and death in sub-Saharan Africa. Now those are just rough figures. You ought to subscribe to a magazine called The Voice of the Martyrs. And then you would realize that we're not here just studying the Bible. We're studying the assurance of God that he will take care of us his people. I want you to identify as closely as your imagination can allow you to to these people and therefore identify with the message of the book of Revelation. It's not just a bunch of fairy tales or strange visions. It is an assurance from our God 
that our lives are precious to him. And therefore, it can be a great motivation to serve him. You know, we're faced with choices, some of us nearly every day, whether we shall speak or remain silent for Christ. We're, we're faced with social situations where many of us may decide that it's not the, to our best interest to let people know we're a Christian. But if we catch a glimpse of what's at stake here, what God has really promised us, I think we might have more courage, more conviction, and a whole lot more peace of mind than many of us have. The fact that Jesus said to Peter when he gave him the keys to the kingdom, I say, he said that the, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Mm -hmm. He died in, in power and is under his own power he was resurrected. That's another big it, important part of the resurrection. It gave them the confirmation that Jesus could complete what he said he was going to do. And that he had that power to do so. Yes. And I'm going to go on about when he said, you can't kill me. He said, unless I lay down my life. And that phrase is used more than once in the New Testament. He laid down his life. And the, I, the emphasis is on laying it down. It's like he took off his garment. He was clothed with life. Took it off and put it down. Sometimes I really get angry with myself because I can read these stories about Christ and reduce them to a problem in Greek grammar or something. I thought you would understand. <laughs> and I really do get angry with myself. And when I do, I stop and talk to God. I'm, I sometimes think that we preachers and teachers are somehow enemies of a deep faith in the gospel of Christ, or we can be. We can reduce them to arguments or reduce them to studies in grammar being able to see the forest for the trees. Yeah, and so I want to see, I, I don't want to sound like I'm chastising you without including myself. I've always thought a preacher ought to be on the same side of the river of sin as his congregation because that's where he is whether he will admit it or not. Okay. <coughs> Here we have the ch life of Christ he ruled the nations and he was snatched up to God to the throne of God. There's the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Now, as I pointed out before, this is a number that is equivalent to several other numbers. 42 months of 30 days each is how many days? 1260. Uh, three and a half years of 360 day years is what? 1260. 1260. 42 months, 1260 days, 
three and a half years and even that mysterious time, times and half a time. That doesn't really make sense to us, but if you have one time and two times and half a time, how many do you have? Three and a half, three and a half or 42 months. And these are different ways of looking. If you're taking care of somebody, counting it in days makes some kind of sense. If you're thinking of it as a rule or dynasty of God, a thousand years makes sense. If you're thinking about it as we were when we had the measuring of the sanctuary, in terms of a city under siege, three and a half years. And one of the things that, when I went back and read Hendrickson this week in preparation for this, he points out there was a three and a half year period that no Jew would ever forget. What do you think it was? Destruction of persecution. Uh, we're not sure about that. What? Well, we're not sure how long, exactly how long. What about the three and a half years it didn't rain? When there was a contest, see, between Baal and the servants of God. That's the three and a half years. All during the Christian dispensation, if you'll let me call it that, I prefer from the first appearance of Christ to the second appearance of Christ. All during that time, there is a contest between good and evil, between Baal and Yahweh, between Christ and Satan. And that's what's going on here. So that the church will be in existence from the first appearance of Christ, the, the ascension, until he appears again. I prefer the word appearance to coming because it is closer to the parousia idea that's in Greek. Okay. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Now, this brings up one of the great uh, theological problems in the whole Bible. Where did Satan come from? Now, this, in this highly figurative language, John Milton, thoroughly steeped in medieval theology, even though he was a Puritan and was rebelling against medieval theology, he accepted the idea and they go back to the passage in Isaiah where it says, O oh, great Lucifer, day star, how the mighty are fallen. There's only one thing wrong with that, folks. That's not talking about a pre-creation battle in heaven. Lucifer there is Cyrus the Persian who will be the instrument of God for returning the Jews from Babylonian captivity and will claim that he did it on his own. And nearly every Bible scholar that's ever studied that will tell you that. Now, in my book, I come to this conclusion, that since God made everything that really existed, that's as good a story as you're going to get. 
And so uh, while I'm a little leery of putting too much weight on it, it is now, but notice here, this seems to put the battle between the Archangel Michael and Satan in a different human time because we've had the birth of Christ and it follows that. Did you notice that? I think this is probably what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says that he destroyed the principalities and powers by the work he did on the cross. That he overcame the powers in the heavenlies. There's no word called heavenlies, but I made that word up because that's it's a, almost a translation of the Greek directly that it was in his crucifixion and resurrection that Christ won over Satan. It's a bit like parallel events? Yes. But no, that's what, that's what did it. See, he won by dying. In, as the disciples returned from their first encounter of really experiencing power over demons in the name of Christ, Christ makes a statement, I saw Satan fall. And his declaration is not that he has a video of Satan falling from heaven. It's that the power encounter is here. You guys are on the winning team. Yes. Now you're 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 in the right you're in the right pew. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the idea. Jesus himself says that you you cannot go into a strong man's house and take away his possessions unless you first bind the strong man. By the way, that same Greek word bind there is used over when it, Satan is bound. Same word. And so it is Christ who binds Satan. People don't like that interpretation because so that makes Christ the, the thief that breaks in. Yes. That's exactly, that's, uh, that's, I, well, I'll tell you what, you have to give Satan some to you. <laughs> <laughs> but. God, the, I got a question. Okay. So God made Satan. Yeah. Who created Satan? Yeah. God made a creature who was capable of becoming Satan. He didn't make Satan. Just like he did not make Adam and Eve sin, although he knew they would. Uh, you're getting into questions that you can spend your life on and not being a, not be able to answer. That's why I asked the question. I know. <laughs> uh, I have to say I don't know, <laughs> and I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'll tell you what. There's one thing I do know that whenever and whoever Satan is, his power has already been rendered null and void as far as I'm concerned by the name of Christ that I have owned. And someday I might share with you, I did share it with some of you, about my only brush with what I think was probably demon possession and how the name of Christ worked in that. If you want me to do that next time, remind me and I'll share it with you. Good.